Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. We have good news today. We are confident that we are uh, succeeding in experiencing a significant decline of Omicron cases in our state. And this will allow us in the upcoming weeks to take further steps uh, forward in regaining a more normal life in the state of Washington while still protecting our public health and our family's health. But we know that COVID has changed significantly during the last two years, and our efforts have been uh, significantly uh, aggressive in addressing those changes. And now we have changes that will allow us in the next several weeks to take the next step forward into regaining what we consider a much more normal lives. Uh, obviously, we know we still have to be cautious because the rate actually remains high today, but this is good news for us to uh, have a relief in sight that I am pleased to be able to announce today. Now, before I talk about the specific strategy moving forward, I wanted to share how we have uh, uh, devised this strategy and based on what science and data we have used to make these uh, forthcoming decisions. As you know, we have relied upon data and science to guide us throughout this period of this pandemic that has served us very well in saving tens of thousands of lives. And we continue to look at the science and data to guide us in the decisions in the next several weeks. And I wanna to talk to you about the current status in that regard. Uh, first, I'd like to talk with you about the existing level of hospitalizations we have in our state. This is important because our, our real goal here is to uh, reduce the infection rates low enough that our, our hospitals would not experience being jammed with COVID patients. So if we can have the first slide, please. Is that up now? Thank you very much. So this slide will show you the graph showing our hospitalizations on a daily basis on a rolling average throughout the pandemic. You will note that we have reached a peak and that we are fortunately coming down. That's really good news. Now that's the good news, but there is a hint of caution, obviously, that you will see that the hospitalization rate today is higher still than any other time in the pandemic except the last couple of weeks. So the number of people entering our hospitals today is still extremely high, continues to put pressures uh, on our hospital, and unfortunately continues to take lives in our state. So we know that we have some good news here, but we know we have a journey still ahead of us to get these hospitalization numbers down so that people can go into hospitals and get treatment when they need it for heart attacks and car accidents and everything else. Okay, enough of that slide. Just uh, take the slide down, that one down. No, down. Okay, thank you. So next, so here's what we are, what we want to do. Our goal is to knock down the rates of this infection by taking smart, common sense measures that we know that works for the next immediate future to knock these numbers down low enough so that the hospital admissions get low enough not to jam our hospitals. So what I'm gonna share with you is a graph that will show what we believe is a realistic prediction of our ability to achieve that goal. So let's put the slide up, please. Now, this slide, and I'm going to spend a minute on this to make sure people can understand it. This slide shows the uh, predictions, the projections of the, of the hospitalization rates that we will experience in the next several weeks. The gray area is the range of the projections from the very optimistic to the very pessimistic. The red line that goes down as it goes to the right, as you can see, represents the midline, if you will, of the projected hospitalizations on a daily basis that we will have in the upcoming several weeks. Now, obviously, what we want to do is to get that red line down low enough so that we can avoid our hospitals getting jammed. Now, you'll see a horizontal line uh, also. Is it green or blue? I can't see it from here. <laughs> it's blue. 
That line represents the level of daily admissions that we believe is safe to get down to a level that we will be able to maintain our hospitals in good shape. So what we want to do is to continue our efforts to reduce infections to get down to that low line. And where those lines meet, frankly, is, is the magic point where we believe we will be safe uh, to be able to uh, uh, eliminate some of our common sense measures that we know have worked, including masking. So now I'll show you where those lines meet, or very close. So you'll see the green vertical line. This is March 21st, and basically it is very close to where those lines meet to show when we project we will be in a position to be able to uh, reduce some of our requirements and therefore save our hospitals from being overrun. And obviously, uh, we're headed in the right direction. Okay, we're done with that slide now. So considering these best projections based on the best science, the best epidemiology that we have today, and best on what is good for Washington State, uh, we are confident that we will be able to reach a level by March 21st where we, we can uh, remove the requirement to wear masks in most of our, our situations. So we will be removing the mask mandate uh, in our schools and in our uh, public indoor spaces uh, as of Monday, March 21st. That means on March 21st, we will no longer have a state mandate for wearing masks in schools. And on March 21st, we will no longer have a state mandate for wearing masks in indoor spaces. We think that's a very important step in the next part of our journey to normalcy. Now, there are some uh, places where masks still will be required in healthcare settings, uh, in, in, um, in outpatient, dental, long-term care, and correctional facilities. Obviously, that makes sense because these are places where people are very close together and have a lot of vulnerable people who are associated with health care delivery uh, systems. Uh, we should note the federal government has their own requirements that include transportation, which still do require masks, and that includes in buses. So we, obviously that is a federal requirement. We can only control the state. So the good news is we are approaching a place fairly shortly where we will not have to be wearing masks generally in these, in these conditions. And we think this is both good for uh, our health and our education of our children and the total reopening of our economy. And we should be very pleased with the progress we have made. And I want to thank Washingtonians who have put us in a position to be able to make this progress. We are in a position to be able to make this progress because people have been careful, have by and large follow our mandates, and have been responsible, and have most Washingtonians have got vaccinated as well. This is what has allowed us to be in this position to reduce, reduce these mask mandates. Now, I know, uh, I know folks, uh, this has been a long, long journey. I know people would want to say it's totally over today or, you know, at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, that would not be consistent with where the science is right now. But I do understand the urgency, the, the, the desire, obviously, to do
possible is by COVID-19, 16 times. These vaccines work big time. And I must share with you that the threat of COVID will not be eliminated on March 21st. And we will still have mechanisms to protect ourselves. And I'm encouraging all Washingtonians to get on that blue line, save yourself, get vaccinated, get a booster. It's good for you and it's good for your health. Okay, we can move forward. I also want to note that people will be able to make their individual decisions about wearing masks after March 21st. Uh, you will be able, should you desire to wear a mask, to wear a mask uh, in your place of business or your shopping or anywhere else. And that will be part of our order to protect you and your ability should you desire to do so. That seems to go with the, it goes with the students in our schools. They will be able, should they desire, if they'd like to wear a mask, or teachers, they can wear a mask. And we will protect that right. I think that that is important. And I know that our schools will do a good job in protecting those students they, who wants to wear a mask. Maybe some of the folks in their class does not. We're not going to allow them to be bullied as well. And I know our schools are going to protect them in this regard. So, uh, uh, one other note, uh, this will also, we are removing the state mandate for masks, but this will not remove the ability of businesses or other entities to make their own independent decision for uh, their business. So businesses will still be allowed, should they desire to require folks to wear a mask, we will not remove their ability to do that. That will be independent uh, decision making. So with that, we have uh, uh, Dr. Amir Shaw for some comments in regard to this decision. Dr. Shaw. Hi, Governor. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, your opening comments. And let me just uh, also say uh, that I too am um, hopeful for where uh, this pandemic is going, uh, both not just here uh, in the state of Washington, but across the country, we're seeing the trajectory of cases that appears to be on the decline and that obviously is good and welcome news for all of us. But I think more importantly, as Governor has mentioned, it's really the hospitalizations and the numbers that's decreasing as well that continues to be a, a number that we're all watching. And it's also something that is allowing for capacity to come back in the healthcare system. Uh, no doubt the healthcare system is still stressed uh, in many ways, um, and it's going to continue to, to be so. Uh, we do wanna continue to remind individuals in Washington uh, to do all the things they can to be safe and also be able to uh, assure that that healthcare system continues to have the capacity to take care of emergencies in particular. One of the things that the governor just um, highlighted, and I want to make sure to point out, is that the strong protection against severe disease is very much about vaccines. And we've been saying this for well over a year. Obviously, the additional message of not just vaccines, but boosters is critical. When we have over 70 2% of our population that's fully vaccinated and over 80% of our population um, that um, is eligible has had one dose. That really helps us in the state of Washington, but that still implies there are people who have not gotten vaccinated that have not gotten their boosters. And we wanna make sure that we continue to remind everybody of the importance of both vaccines, boosters, and even masking uh, where necessary. So as the governor pointed out, that there are a few things that we need to be thinking about as we move into this next phase. One is living with COVID means that we don't know how long COVID is gonna be around, but we wanna make sure we go on with our activities and enjoy those activities, but that we do so safely. And also, as was mentioned, that we do also want, as we said um, affectionately from the Department of Health standpoint this past summer, respect the rules of the room. Know what's happening in the local health jurisdiction, know what's happening in the individual businesses, and respect those rules. So if there is a 
the N2, which there will be on March 21st, a statewide requirement for masking. That does not mean that a local health jurisdiction or an, a business uh, may not decide to have an individual requirement in, in their community and or in their in, um, business. So that's one part of it, but the other part is to be respectful to people. As we have individuals who may still feel comfortable wearing masks, uh, our kids, there are some, many who still want to continue to wear masks through the end of the school year. Be respectful of that, and that is absolutely critical as we move forward. But the news is positive. The news is, again, such that we feel confident with the numbers and the projections as the governor has outlined that while masks may still be recommended from a public health standpoint, and by the way, they are, and we also strongly recommend vaccines and boosters, it is really important for Washingtonians to know what kinds of activities they can go into, do, and be a part of while they're also doing those activities and doing them safely. And I also want to join Governor in saying thank you to Washingtonians for everything that they have been doing, they continue to do, and in particular, as a not just as a physician and a public health professional, but as a parent, I also want to thank fellow parents for how hard it's been for our kids and all the different things that we all have been doing to assure their safety as they continue in-person schooling. And I really want to also thank our educational partners, uh, both the superintendent today, but also all of our principals and superintendents and teachers and faculty and staff, as well as the parents, and in particular, the kids who have done everything they can to continue to be safe. And we want to continue to assure their safety as we move forward. So with that, Governor, I will turn it back to you and just say this is a, a an incredibly important milestone for us in the state of Washington, and we're thankful that we're getting there. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Thanks for your whole team, Lacey Fehrenbach and others, and Michelle, who've helped increase our vaccinations and made a science-based decision here, and I appreciate your team's efforts. Uh, I want to note, too, that this is not the end of our effort of, of keeping our, our students, our children safe. Schools will still uh, be continuing uh, doing smart things, using smart testing and the like to protect our children in school. And I'm glad about that. There will be some revisions of that in the near future, and I think schools will appreciate those when those happen. Uh, we now have uh, our superintendent of public instruction, Chris Rakel. Chris. Thank you, Governor. Uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, really being a part of this moment. Two years ago, the governor and I stood before the people of the state of Washington and on that fateful day announced that schools were closing in this state, and they closed in all states across the country. At 1.53 million children uh, nationwide were not in in-person learning. From the five-year-old to the 105-year-old, everybody had a part in a shared responsibility to each other. It involved uh, face covering and distancing and hygiene, and, and in some cases, closures. The impacts have been broad. Uh, but we also became a state that rapidly addressed this in ways uh, the country was envious of. Half the hospitalization rate per 100,000, half of the loss of life per 100,000. So I want to thank the governor and our partners in health and everybody else who through the duration of this kept health in the focus, even as we continued to open. And I would remind folks that a year after that date, uh, we said we're going to get back to in-person learning. And the end of that school year last year, we were 30% or more in person. Within two months, we announced that we would be fully in person this year. And we did open statewide in person. And only briefly have we had uh, temporary closures of schools or reversions to remote learning. But all of that's because the science continued to allow us to open up more and more and continue to do uh, what Washingtonians expected while we kept everyone safe. And this is a big moment. Uh, this, as you heard, doesn't mean we are at the end of a, of a complicated virus that's global. It means we get uh, a little bit more flexibility now to take that next step. We'll do it effectively in school. We'll continue to be safe. Um, while folks will have the opportunity to wear masks if they choose, uh, this takes the state mandate out of the way. And I think it's important for folks to recognize that uh, together we got here. Uh, I also want to say a, a big thank you to um, <clears throat> all of our local health officials who have complicated jobs, our school board members. They're making decisions every day about our health. And before any of us knew what COVID was, those folks were making everyday health decisions in flu season and in months uh, outbreaks and other significant public health risks, and much of this will go back to them. Um, but they've been really hard working through all of this. They've been good partners, and we'll, and we'll expect that to be the case going forward. To every teacher, student, uh, superintendent, principal, school board member, thank you. 
Uh, these are tough moments and uh, it has had impact, uh, an impact that we understood to be a reality when masks were really just one of the only things we had. But with subsequent vaccines, uh, rapid testing and what we know now uh, about the uh, ultimate science of this virus, uh, we're at a pretty powerful moment here where we take another step to, to normalcy. So thank you, Governor, uh, to everyone here. There's a lot more to follow. We'll follow up with school districts, uh, but this is a big moment for us and we take that next step at the response of the of the people of the state of Washington and uh, to our students, uh, hang with us here till the 21st. Please wear those face coverings. It is the law. Um, it's important that we uh, keep that responsibility to each other, that we maintain that expectation to look after one another. That's what got us to be one of the safest states through this whole pandemic, and that's what will carry us through. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for your leadership. Um, following the law, we're has continued ability to save lives as, as it has. And it has, as, as people have noted, you know, we have reduced deaths by tens of thousands of people because we have followed the science. Other states that have not followed the science uh, have had tens of thousands or more deaths per capita. We, we may have saved 17,000 plus lives comparing our death rate to other states. So science has, has done very well by us, and that's why we continue to hew to it as a guide. And we think that this is the right goal, which is to make sure that people can have hospitals that can care for them. And this is still a problem. Now, we have chosen a date for ending this mask mandate. I know that there are some people who feel that it, it should have been ended earlier. I also know that there's a lot of people who think it maybe is ending too soon, and everyone is entitled to their opinion about this. To those who think maybe it should end earlier, all I can tell you is we lost 1,000 people in January to this disease, 1,000 people. And when we make decisions, it seems to me we ought to have a recognition of how dangerous and deadly this disease still is after this period of time. And it cannot be allowed to blind us the fact that we're making progress to the fact that we are not where we need to be yet as a state to be safe. And to those who think it's done too early, I can tell you that I think we've demonstrated a commitment to safety and health in our state. And I am confident, based on this epidemiological evidence, that we will achieve our goal of making sure that we knock this disease down low enough where our hospitals can be safe. And that's a big deal. I've had two relatives in the last week who spent nights in a gurney in a hallway of an emergency department because there wasn't room in a hospital. I am confident we will get down to a place in the third week of March where that will no longer be the case. So I ask everybody's continued commitment I want to thank everybody who's pulled on the rope because I know everybody has here. And I am glad to be able to take another step forward for the great state of Washington. With that, you may uh, fire when ready, Gridley. Up first, we'll go to Rachel with AP. Go ahead, Rachel. Good afternoon. Um, Governor, given your focus on that March 21st date based on the hospital admission projections, do you plan to lift the state of emergency around that time? And if not, when? And then separately, just a few moments ago, Governor Newsom announced that California would be shifting to an endemic approach to the pandemic, ramping up on things like surveillance of wastewater and increasing testing if a new variant is detected in order to avoid future mandates. So either for the governor or Dr. Shaw, what does our endemic plan look like? Uh, well, the emergency order, uh, uh, will not be lifted on March 21st. We do have to maintain it for several reasons. Uh, one, it needs to be maintained in part because it allows us to have access to federal funds, which is obviously very important. Second, there are things that will remain important, one of which is to guarantee that people have the right to wear a mask at work and so that the employer can't order them to go maskless. That's important. We also have some important protections for our people in our medical facilities, our people in our long-term care facilities. Uh, those folks can, will continue to, to be needed and protected by some of these measures. There are also some measures in the school system that will continue, as I've indicated, 
to make sure that our children continue to be protected by having some testing requirements and the like for our school children. So it won't be, the emergency order itself will not be listed on March 21st, but an enormous step forward because I think it's fair to say that the masking requirement in our places of work and in our, our schools has been a significant frustration to people, to all of us, and this is an enormous step forward, I, I believe, on this journey. So uh, there is no you know, dedicated end date to the emergency order. It's like the last two years, we will be following the science and making decisions. But there is some more work to do after March 21st. The issue on California, I'm not sure, I haven't seen the, you know, what, what you're referring to. Uh, California continues, as of at least this morning, uh, they have a mask requirement in schools. Uh, we were last advised that that in late February, they'll make some decision as to when to lift it. If they did that this morning, that would be news uh, to me. And that's similar to Oregon, which has, uh, they will not lift their mask mandate till March 31st. Illinois, which has not lifted their mask mandate. New Mexico, Hawaii, a number of states, I think are heading generally in the same direction that we are. But I think if I, and I've not heard what Governor Newsom said, but based on your question, this idea of thinking of how do we move to the next stage of this effort, you know, that's a reasonable thing. We're making a step in that direction that's, I think, quite important, quite dramatic, and quite positive today. Dr. Shaw, do you want to add anything? Yeah, Governor, I, I think just um, a, a couple of things from where we are from a public health standpoint is really, again, um, we're shifting our prioritization, if you will, to especially uh, those who are most vulnerable uh, to outbreaks, uh, to settings where we're very concerned. Um, you know, for example, a, a hospital or a long-term care, nursing home type of setting, uh, but also really the tools that, you know, are really going to be and have been in the hands of our Washingtonian people. And so, Governor, you know, as you had announced with the masks and the at-home tests, I mean, these are tools that really allow for people to do just what you're hearing in other states, which is this opportunity to take the guidance that we have been given, uh, giving and use that guidance with tools to be able to move forward to protect themselves and to know how to protect themselves and the people around them. So I think that is the, the shift that we in public health are making. And then the last thing I would say is that we have, should be very proud in the state of Washington of our, our surveillance activities from you know even detecting Omicron, for example, or other variants. And that biodetection, that enhanced surveillance, including with wastewater or other tools, those are the kinds of tools that we also are looking at, pivoting to, shifting to, and really reminding ourselves of the importance of those tools from a public health standpoint as we move forward. So just wanted to add that, Governor. Yeah, and if I just dovetail on that, there's one thing I hope does not happen as a result of this uh, new decision, and this is forward progress. I certainly hope it doesn't diminish people's understanding of how important these vaccines are. We do have to recognize, even after we've made this great progress, this is gonna remain a deadly disease. And I know too many people, I've gone to too many memorial services for people who've died, not to understand that vaccine is still a really, really good idea. And I hope people will concentrate on that. By the way, uh, Rachel, thank you. Uh, you have not inaccurately reported uh, what other states are doing some of our great media outlets have. They've reported many states have removed their mandates when they have not, but that's a small matter. Next question comes from Joe with the Seattle Times. Go ahead, Joe. Hello, two questions. Uh, first one for the governor, as we approach the two year mark since the start of the pandemic, how should, uh, should residents feel hopeful that we're getting near the end or what should they be thinking about this sort of next phase that we're going into. And then second question for the governor or state health officials. When the Omicron variant surge hit, we didn't have enough tests uh, to respond uh, very quickly and nimbly. So what are state health officials doing uh, right now to uh, prepare in case another variant of concern pops up? Dr. Shaw, you want to talk about that second one there first? Yeah, let, let me let me jump in. And, and Lacey, you can also uh, chime in on this one. You know, I, I think the uh, you're absolutely right that the tools are not just the at-home tests that are uh, in the hands of Washington. Is remember three and a half million and counting for 
Washingtonians, but that does not include the one million going to schools and the other million going to local partners. So we're talking a significant amount of tests that are going into the hands of our community members. But also in addition to that, it's really about community testing and ways that people can get tested if they uh, need to. I think the key message as we've been watching this and, you know, Governor and his team, as well as our teams continue to watch a number of measures, which we've been you know, saying throughout this press conference. But one of those has been the demand. What is the demand for vaccines? What's the demand for boosters? What's the demand for community testing. And that community testing demand is also a measure. And so the good news is that if someone, anyone across the state of Washington needs to get a vaccine, needs to get a booster, needs to make sure their kid gets a, a child gets a vaccine or a booster or needs to get a test they can do that that was not the case previously in previous phases of this pandemic and that is why it's so important that we continue to make those tools available and also give the guidance on how those tools can be used so lacy anything you want to add and then we'll turn it back to the governor no, just we'll add that we have been trying to diversify the uh, manufacturers that we use to procure supplies. Um, in addition, the supply chain is loosening up a little bit nationally, so that is helpful um, and wanting to make sure that we have availability of uh, tests for schools, for communities, and for the public. And that there, a uh, quick reminder that there are tests still available on the Say Yes COVID Home Test website for Washingtonians that have not yet ordered one. So if you'd like a kit for your home, you can do that. You can also continue to order from the federal site covidtests.gov. So that um, the community has those tests in their medicine kits uh, when they need them. And we're all prepared for any future, um, whether those are regional outbreaks or surges or statewide or national surges. Um, we're prepared ahead and not responding when they happen. Yeah, I should also know too, I think the state should feel good. We're one of the few states that where the state government had an online portal that can deliver a test to your house within 24 or 48 hours. That has been very appreciated by a lot of Washingtonians. And I think DOH did a great job in Amazon setting that up very, very quickly. I also appreciate that we've distributed, I think about 800,000 tests uh, kits or tests to our schools so that they continue uh, to be able to test uh, their students and we're going to continue those efforts. On the vaccine front though, I do want to uh, say that this, we need the federal government largely to be responsible for the production and development of vaccines. That's something that really needs the federal government uh, to move forward on. Your question, Jan Joe, I guess is, you know, where is the end? You know, I'm not sure, you know, no human being can tell you where the end of COVID is. It appears it will be with us for some period of time, and we will have to figure out how to live with this existing virus. And it, assumedly, will remain a fatal disease for some period of time. But the question is, can we get to a point where we dramatically reduce the mandatory things and respond to it? And the answer is, we're moving in that direction, taking another big step today. And let's not forget the steps we've taken. Our businesses are not closed. Our gyms are open. Our restaurants are open. Our schools are open. There are very few limitations of what you can actually do today. We've done that already, and now we're removing one of the last vestiges of things that, that, that are inhibited for people. So we've made a lot of progress on this, and we've got a few more steps. We gotta, we've got to stick to it. And if we do that, I believe we're gonna people keep our hospitals open People who have a heart attack are going to be able to get treatment, and we will provide uh, protection for our kids as well. And I think we're going to achieve that. Next question comes from Laurel with the Spokesman Review. Go ahead, Laurel. Hi, I have uh, two questions. The first, probably for Dr. Shaw. Um, with lower vaccine rates and still higher case rates, how vulnerable are communities in eastern Washington to further outbreaks as masks start to come off? Just wondering if you can address the risk of transmission there versus Western Washington. Um, and then secondly, for Superintendent Rakedahl and possibly the governor, we've seen a number of school districts already discussing getting rid of masks regardless of state guidance. So can you just talk about what happens to those districts if they do decide between now and March 21st that they'll just remove masks regardless? Yeah, let me let me just jump in first and say that, you know, obviously one of the higher vaccination vaccinated states in the nation and that's something we 
thank Washingtonians because ultimately it's been Washingtonians who have rolled up their sleeves and gotten the vaccines throughout this pandemic. And that has been amazing. And we are so thankful for that. But that said, when, when, when I gave the number of 72 plus percent that are fully vaccinated of the eligible population or 80 plus percent have gotten one dose, here's the challenge. And we've said this for a year plus, it is not that same percentage every part of our state in every community, in every neighborhood. And that is the challenge. If we could get that percentage all the way through, we would be in a markedly different place. And so there are communities, even in high neighborhoods in higher, higher vaccinated communities that still have pockets where you don't have as much of the vaccinated in those very neighborhoods. So what that means is that we, do want to watch and continue to monitor what's happening in places where the vaccination rates are not higher. And we want to make sure that we watch that closely, regardless of whether it's in Eastern Washington or frankly, whether it's in King County or any of the surrounding counties in the Puget Sound area, we need to make sure that we emphasize the importance of vaccines. We emphasize the importance of boosters. We emphasize the importance of parents getting their kids vaccinated. And we also emphasize the layered approach for protection. All that doesn't go away because as the governor mentioned, and this is such an important point, March 21st is such an important milestone, but the pandemic does not end then. We continue to have to do the things to keep ourselves and those around us safe. So I hope that helps answer that question. Governor, I'll turn it back. Yeah, answer to your other question. Look, we understand there's people who have different opinions about this. Uh, but we do look forward to districts working to follow the law of the state of Washington and, and make reasoned decisions. Uh, they, are, they fully understand the consequences of breaking the law of potentially you know, losing funding or potentially having it, labor and industries fines or all those potentials. But I think actually the most important thing is we want to get our children educated. And I think one of the most important lessons for our children is that in the state of Washington, we have a democracy and we, we follow the law. And I think this is an important teaching moment that I hope ultimately uh, educators will want to share with their students that even if we have disagreements, we follow the law. And I, and I hope that uh, that, that will be the, the prevailing sentiment and, and is at the moment. Next question comes from Austin with Northwest News Network. Go ahead, Austin. Uh, hi, thanks. Governor, can you explain again the metric you were trying to show about hospitalizations? What What is it you're trying to get to by March 21st? And as a follow-up, there, there's a lot of reasons why hospitals are full up, and it's not all because of COVID. There are patients who can't get out of the hospital. There's other factors leading to this. There will be some who feel like they're being penalized and have to wait more than 30 days for reasons that aren't about COVID, but about bigger problems in our hospital uh, networks. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand your second question, Austin. If, if you're saying COVID's not a problem in our hospitals, I, I just think that's factually wildly inaccurate. The reason our hospitals have had a huge increase in, in people needing beds is because of COVID. I mean, I think that's very clear. So I'm not sure I understand what you're driving at. Every hospital will tell you that. And yes, uh, we have a nursing shortage. Yes, we have people having heart attacks, but we're not having more heart attacks than we did three years ago. We're having thousands of people getting COVID that we didn't have three years ago. So this clearly is the principal reason for the crisis in our hospitals recently. And if I misunderstand your question, let me know, but it's just what you said is wildly inaccurate as to why the hospitals are jammed. And I do want to reiterate, the people in the hospitals have been working so hard for two years now, extended time, having to wear PPE, having to deal with folks like my relatives who spent nights on the side of a gurney. These hospitals are still jammed because of COVID. And we have to find a way to get our infections down where that will not re have a resurgence to come back to have this crisis in hospitals again. And they're still to some degree in a crisis mode at this moment. So to go to the, to the scientific aspect of this, if we can put this uh, graph up again. Okay, so I'm gonna walk through this again. I think this is a very important one and I appreciate your question. 
First, let's talk about the goal. The goal is to get the hospital admission rates down to uh, five per 100,000 because at that level, we have done a rigorous assessment at that level of hospital admissions, the hospitals will be able to have relatively normal functions at that level of admission. And so that's the goal. So the goal is depicted by this blue horizontal line, which shows you what the goal is. So then the question is, how fast can we get to that goal? I'd like to say it's today. If it was today, we could lift this mandate today. And if it was tomorrow, we could lift it tomorrow. So then we look, what do we think we're going to be able to achieve with Washingtonians' assistance? And they've been fantastic so far. We think we're going to be able to achieve a decline, which is represented with the highest degree of probability by that red line. So you see that red line depicts the decline in the hospitalizations on a daily basis that we believe we will be able to achieve on each particular date. And so where those lines cross is the magic point that means we're across the goal line for what we want to achieve. And you see March 21st there is just very close to where they intersect. And we chose a Monday instead of a Wednesday because we want to give kids the ability to start fresh uh, on a week. So basically, we followed the science to tell us what do we have to do to achieve that goal. I think it is a goal that is universally shared in the state of Washington. People want to be able to go to a hospital. We can take the graph down now. People want to go to a hospital and be able to get treatment. People don't want their 104-year-old relatives on a gurney out in the hallway for a couple of nights. They really want hospitals to function. And we want to give them that. And the way to give them that is to keep this mask uh, strategy in place for a few more weeks till we get down, down to that level. And uh, I'm proud that we have some of the best epidemiologists in the world to help us design this system. So it's, it's built on science, it's built on data, and it's built on health. Now, do you have any follow-up questions to that, Austin? No, and I wasn't suggesting COVID isn't a, a key factor in this, just that there's a lot of other factors at place uh, at play, but I appreciate the explanation. I just want to be clear, are we at 30 per 100,000 right, uh, right now, and you're trying to get to 5 per 100,000, correct? I'm not seeing the graph right in front of me, so I can't remember the exact number. If, if the red line is at 30, yes. <laughs> yeah. Wherever the red line hits that vertical axis, is that 30, Candace? 30. Did no, it. Dr. Shad, what number would you think is most accurate? Yeah, I think it's somewhere between that uh, 10 and um, 20. If I'm if I'm reading this, it looks like it's closer to 20. It actually may be between 20 and 30, about 22, 23, something of that nature. And I, and, and I just wanted to add, um, Governor, just two quick things. One is that. You know, it, it, it's a summation of information. This is the key one that we're watching, but it's also the declining cases that we're seeing across the state, which is also great. We're also seeing, um, uh, we had seen an increase in deaths across uh, Washington. That has also started to decline. And I, I do want to just make mention that as we do this, we continue to look at all this information and then come to what that projection is. Now, that doesn't mean that if we rise above that, um, uh, once uh, March 21st passes, that we automatically will will go and reinstate something because then we need to continue to look at where we are in the healthcare system. But Governor, there's one other really good point that I, I just need to continue to emphasize, and a lot of people are missing this. This is really about this question about that Austin asked about COVID and COVID diagnoses. So I have a family member right now that is in the hospital. Uh, they, they're in uh, for a reason that's not COVID. Uh, when they were the decision was being made for admission, they, that person, that individual was tested. And fortunately, that test came back negative. If that test had come back positive, it does not mean that individual was admitted for COVID-19. But here's what's really important, Austin, that still, if that person tests positive for COVID-19, the donning and doffing and the way the infection control that is required by the staff to handle that individual and the sanitation 
across the room and everything else, supplies, et cetera, that are required because that individual tests positive for COVID-19, that adds an additional burden to the healthcare system. That's what we're hearing from both our healthcare providers, from our nurses. We're also hearing that from the administrators in hospitals, and we're seeing it every single day. So it's not just is it from COVID or with COVID or due to COVID? It's the fact that anytime you throw in COVID as part of the mix, it now adds a burden of care and infection control to the practitioner. And that is a huge piece that's not been covered. And that is something we're hearing every day from our hospital partners. Thanks, there is, yeah, Thank you. There is something in Austin's question I want to note. It is correct. There are quite a number of things we can do and we have been doing to decrease the burden on hospitals. So we would like to be able to discharge people faster from the hospitals. You betcha that's been a challenge for us. That's why we've opened up dozens of new beds in our long-term care facilities uh, on the state dime so that we can have a place for, for those people to go. We've put in the National Guard into our hospitals. We have had a federal contract where we have brought in any number of nurses and professionals to help in our hospitals. In long term, we have to increase the production of nurses and technical staff to be able uh, to deal with, uh, with long term needs. So I just want to point out, yes, there are things we, we need to do, and we have been doing them. And that's why we've uh, got over the apex and the worst parts of, the, of this hospital, but they are still stressed. By the way, as far as the date, uh, I will send you, Austin, we'll put the date, I'll, I'll do a vertical line on today's date, and you'll be able to see where that is. I will send that to you. I'll share it with the press. Next question comes from Jerry with the Everett Herald. Go ahead, Jerry. Thank you very much for taking my questions. Uh, one question for Lacey and one for Superintendent. Uh, I was on the dashboard from the Department of Health looking for the latest 14-day case rate. Uh, I found one, but it was only through February 3rd, so I wondered if you might be able to provide the latest 14-day rate for per 100,000. And then for Superintendent Regdahl, could you go through some of the changes that schools will be uh, encountering on the 21st, if I understand uh, things like the three-foot required distance, social distance, that will no longer be required. And I'm wondering what other uh, in, in changes are coming and if athletics will be affected as well. Um, thank you. Thanks, um, I can start. So on case rates, uh, I, I do wanna provide some perspective because that also is declining and we want that to continue to get lower. That will help keep uh, students in classrooms, workers at work sites and community members safer. The lower the overall transmission rate is, the lower the risk there is for um, getting infected and having outbreaks. Uh, we had a peak case rate of about 1,740 cases per 100,000, uh, I believe, on uh, January 14th. And the most recent complete case rate is through February 3rd, which is on our dashboard. That is 645 per 100,000 over. And these are seven, excuse me, these are seven day rates. So um, 1740 per 100,000 over seven days and 645 now, um, that is February 3rd. All of the data on the dashboard are the most recent data that we have. So you can see cases plotted in the days February 4th through um, early part of this week. However, with the volume of cases that are coming in, they're not considered complete until about 10 to 12 days um, you know, in the past. So that, that is the most current rate to your first question. Um, in terms of some of the layered measures and the superintendent can add here, um, we, you know, we will still have some requirements for schools, but things like distancing, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, hand hygiene, uh, ventilation, environmental cleaning, those things will shift to statewide guidance. We will still recommend layered measures in schools that is consistent with CDC guidance. Um, and, you know, we will be working with the schools to support them in choosing measures um, and implementing these measures in a way that keeps students and their uh, faculty and staff as safe as possible. Yeah, thank you, Lacey. And not much to add, uh, Jerry, thank you for the question. 
as you, as you heard, a, a bunch of the CDC guidance that this state has been tightly aligned with as the requirements uh, become uh, just that guidance recommendations, except again, where the governor indicated it looks as if uh, transportation has its own federal requirement uh, in public transportation that, that will likely implicate our buses. Um, so, so school is going to look, you know, quite different on the 21st. Um, but, but as a way of reminder, uh, everyone can continue and should continue these if this is what they feel comfortable with. We never stopped talking about hand hygiene in schools, for example, even pre pandemic. Uh, we're going to keep talking about that. And obviously a lot of students and staff are going to continue to choose to wear their masks. Uh, but this complexity is part of what we'll work through with DOH in the next two weeks, get guidance out to the system so they know exactly uh, where these uh, exceptions still exist due to federal requirements or others. And it's another reason why local school districts just need to continue to work with us for the next three or four weeks here. So we all move together, getting out ahead of this with local um, determinations really does put districts at a significant liability risk because they're trying to make sweeping statements about what they're going to do and not do. And it's not sensitive of the federal requirements that they still have to do. Um, and that puts them at real, real personal liability. The districts in, li in liability, their risk pools are concerned about it. If we just stay together on this, as we have, we coach districts through this uh, all the way through the fall. We had districts wondering if they could go their own way, uh, but those districts wisely said, no, we're going to be a team on this. And I expect the, the rest of the districts around the state to hang with us for four weeks and work together on the on the process of getting to the 21st. Yeah, if I can just add, I think citizens would be much happier to spend their investments in schools on books and teachers rather than than judgments. And I, I hope we're successful in this regard. Next question comes from Shauna with McClatchy. Go ahead, Shauna. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my question kind of um, pertains to the correctional facilities um, that still have mask requirements of, as of now. Um, when will those uh, correctional facilities consider removing the requirements for masks and how will that be decided? It'll be based on scientific assessment of the relative safety in these congregate settings. These are uh, much more risk, uh, risky environments. And obviously when people are in custody, they don't have many choices. So we will make a decision based on the sciences that then exist. We think the infection rates are still too high and we don't have enough predictive capability to, to answer a date in those settings. We do, we believe in other settings, including schools or retail areas, which have less of a risk associated with them, a transmission. So we'll make a decision as we have for the last two years based on data, based on science. And uh, I know we'll be talking about that in upcoming weeks. Next question comes from Melissa with Crosscut. Go ahead, Melissa. Hi, Governor. I guess I wanted to ask about the idea that businesses can still impose mask requirements that they want. Is lifting the requirement, but doing it so much in the future, you know, have it to more than a month till the requirement gets lifted, do you think that will create difficulties for businesses that do want to keep their mask mandates in place? And how do you propose they deal with customers who maybe say, hey, the governor lifted the mask mandate. I don't have to wear a mask. Uh, uh, expletive you. How, you. how should they deal with that? Well, this will be up to them. It, they will have freedom to make a decision of what works for themselves and their customers. And if they don't want to you know, have a, a, a frustrated customer on occasion. They, they may not have their own individual mandate. That's a decision that they will be free to make. We recognize their ability to uh, make decisions for their own enterprises. So we are stepping back and allowing them to make decisions. And whatever decision they make, I hope that they will be as, you know, uh, genial and cautious and friendly as possible. I think the next few weeks is a time for all of us to try to find our inner grace while we get through the finish line here. Next question comes from Hannah with Cairo Radio. Go ahead, Hannah. Thank you. Uh, I have just quick two questions. First, uh, for Dr. Stahl, probably uh, King County Health Officer Dr. Jeff Duchin uh, in yesterday's announcement about the end of the requirement to show vaccination proof continue to stress the need for for masks when we have surges and things like that, high quality masks and other other safety protocols. Can you go over what people should be doing right now when that happens? Yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, just to, to again, reemphasize that what, what we're talking about for March 21st is an end of a statewide requirement 
And that does not mean that we do not have a public health recommendation or strong recommendation or please consider what you're doing, your activity as you go forth with your safety measures or protocols. So what Dr. Duchin, and I didn't see particularly specifically that comment, but I will say that it's consistent with what we've been saying throughout, which is look, as you are in a high surge uh, situation where you have lots of cases, you have lots of hospitalizations, which we have been, then you really get to a point where you have to have requirements because we are really at a point of trying to protect people and protect communities. But when you get past that surge, when numbers start to look better, and as, as we showed with the graph, the, the actual projected numbers look better, then it gets to really people being smart about how they use that information and also what tools they use. So high quality masks are better than lesser quality masks. No mask is not as good as wearing a mask or a face covering. And then when you're in a crowded situation, a crowded setting, I'm not talking about a outdoor setting, I'm not talking about you know where you know people are vaccinated or there's some vaccine verification happening or you yourself are vaccinated boosted. I'm talking about in general, when you're around indoor crowded situations, be careful and wear the mask. And so you know, it, just because requirements aren't there, you still have an opportunity to protect yourself and those around you. This is particularly important for those who have chronic health conditions. You know, somebody who is on cancer treatment or getting steroids or they have heart conditions or they're elderly uh, with, with other comorbidities, we really want to continue to emphasize to them to wear the face coverings as much as they can, especially in indoor crowded settings where they don't know what the vaccination status is of those around them. So what I'm saying or what we at the state public health level are saying and what you're hearing from a partner and the local level is very consistent. Know what's happening, know the context and take the appropriate action to protect yourself and those around you. I, I may note as well that local health authorities, as they have through this period, will have the ability to put their own mandates in if they make that decision. So we're not reducing the ability of local health districts to make the decisions that they think are appropriate uh, in their communities. Up next, we'll go to Graham with Cairo TV. Go ahead, Graham. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, statewide, less than 30% of kids 5 to 11 are fully vaccinated, and many have younger siblings who are not yet eligible for the shots. Did you consider keeping masking requirements for childcare in elementary schools, and are you concerned about the community conflicts that school districts might face if they want to maintain more protective requirements? Well, listen, the, the state is stepping back from a mandate. Other parts of our democracy still have their voices. If those communities have democratically elected groups and may be able to make decisions, we're not eliminating those things. And I hope that those will be make, made with as much peace and respect for diverse opinions as possible. But we're not removing their ability to make those decisions, uh, should they desire. Now, this issue of vaccination, I have to tell you, I'm. I'm frustrated by the low vaccination rate for some of our younger children because it still is protective and also protective to some degree of reducing the transmission risk. You know, one of the reasons for our what we've done in our schools is to prevent the transmission. Even if the children have less of a risk, and it is substantially less than adults, if, if we could break the transmission in the schools to prevent little Johnny from taking the disease home to his grandparents, that was important. But again, I think we're getting down to these numbers that are low enough where that transmission rate is dramatically reduced. And again, our ultimate goal is to prevent our hospitals from breaking. And we believe at these rates, they will be low enough in the third week in March to prevent that from occurring. That is ultimately the goal. But I am hopeful that more parents will avail themselves of this vaccine, which is shown to be extremely effective and extremely safe. And I hope that that will happen. We are over time, but we have one more question and we will go to Dory with Northwest Public Broadcasting. Go ahead, Dory. 
Thank you for taking my question. Why wasn't a county by county approach um, um, considered for the most scientific? Here in Eastern Washington, we have extremely low um, vaccination rates and just a two weeks ago, some of the highest rates in the nation. And we already have school districts refusing the mask mandates and schools are closed here. So can we have those questions, um, both the governor and the superintendent, please? Thank you. Well, we, we have found that uh, th there isn't enough acuity between cities or counties, basically for one reason or another, to make that slicing and dicing the state up into all those, those subunits. It just, it did, it did not work as well. It created a lot of angst. Counties uh, screaming bloody murder because somebody right across the river had a different view. The public did not accept that. It, they really could not understand it. So it was, it was not tenable long term. And I also don't believe that the disparities will be long enough to really justify that. Fortunately, these numbers are going to come down statewide. Uh, they may come down at a little different rate, but in a relatively short period, meaning in the next uh, three weeks, I think that we'll be in good shape in that regard. So we're moving forward on a statewide basis. Yeah, well, I'll only add that um, obviously as you continue to make this transformation, you know, as our state moves from uh, really a tremendous unknown two years ago to significantly greater understanding of the research of the virus, all the mitigation strategies and what we've done to return to a normal a, a normalcy here, you go back to conditions that were in place prior to this in many ways, and that is local health officials um, and other local jurisdictions can make these decisions on their own. Um, if, if there is something in a significant outbreak in a, in a rural county, those officials can make a different decision. As the governor said, the statewide mandates coming off, and that essentially means you do get more local in this. You do get more finite in it. Uh, but what's so unique about rural Washington and urban Washington and density or vaccination rates or access to hospitals is so variable uh, that at this point, it really is important that it come back to locals to make some determinations. And, and I think that's where certainly I landed. And, and obviously, uh, the governor's made a, a, a powerful decision here to remove the statewide mandate to recognize some of that. Any final words, Governor? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, just a comment on where we've been together. It's It's been uh, quite a two years uh, through the closures of our businesses and our jobs, through our difficulties in our schools, through the loss of almost 11,000 of our neighbors. Uh, we understand the difficulties all of us have, have had. It has been a long, long road. And I think that you may think of it as a marathon. I've never run a marathon. I respect those that do. Uh, but I know this about marathons. People don't quit marathons a quarter mile from the finish line. We are very close to being able to remove the, sort of the last vestiges of significant mandates that are necessary for our public health. And we should not stop right before the tape. So we're going to continue to run through that tape in the next several weeks. And I believe we will get there. And when we get there, I believe we will have safety for our citizens to make sure our hospitals open. Our children will have now the ability to have a vaccine, which is almost universally available. They will be able to wear masks should they desire to wear masks. And we will have knocked down this virus to, to very, very low levels. So uh, we're going to be in such a better shape in a few weeks. I am super pleased to be able to announce this. And I look forward to everybody being healthy. And congratulations to uh, Cooper Cup. Take care.